congratulations. Thank you for having a birthday and giving us an occasion to get all of these wonderful people together in the same room. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, is Jeremy here? I, I actually gave Jeremy his title back. I, I took the there and back again out of my title, so, so we can fight over it in the proceedings. Um, but I'm going to talk about graphs and matrices. That's no surprise. I always talk about graphs and matrices. Uh, and in particular, how each has supported the other over the years, and in particular, with a focus on computation, how each has focused, how each has supported the other over the years um, in computational ways. And then once you start talking about computation, you also have to talk about programming. How are you actually going to organize the computation? Um, which of course is another subject that Alan has made tremendous contributions to. And so while most of this talk is, is retrospective, there's not really anything new about graphs and matrices in this talk, I'm going to finish up with a challenge about programming that I hope, I hope somebody will, will take me up on. Um, if I recall correctly, and Alan may be able to correct me, I, well, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure I met him for the first time when he was an assistant professor at Berkeley and, and I was in Palo Alto. Uh, the first time I actually remember with a picture in my mind was when Alan was giving a talk at, at REACS at NASA in Mountain View. And I remember him explaining very clearly a round robin parallel algorithm for something, but I have no idea at this point what it was. I, that, sounds, that sounds exactly right. Okay, Alan remembers better than that. And since then, I couldn't make a list. I just feel like I've, I've, I've always known him. Uh, one other memory from, from those early days, um, I guess Alex told us yesterday about the pithiness of Alan's emails. Um, and I, I very clearly remember one email from 1996 uh, which was, I, I am absolutely certain, it was the shortest recommendation letter I ever read for anybody, and it was also the most effective. And it was when Sivan Toledo was applying for a postdoc at Xerox Park, and uh, of course, Sivan got the postdoc. Um, Alan and I maybe, maybe have interacted more intensely since the early 2000s. And that's because in the year 2002, I was ready to go back to academia after a dozen years or so at Park. And Alan very generously invited me to come to MIT for a year on a sort of inter-job sabbatical, as it were. And, and <laughs> well, I thought it was, it was exactly what I needed at the time um, to decom decompress from working for corporate America and prepare for working for academic um, academia again. Uh, that year, 2002, changed my life in a lot of ways, um, including how to think about parallel computing, how to think about parallel programming. Uh, a lot of it was this course, which has been mentioned before, yesterday and today, which was Alan's 18.337 class in applied parallel computing, which I sat in on during, during one half of that year. Maybe I helped a little bit with it, probably not. Um, and it, as it says here, it taught me a lot about how to think about math and computer science and computation altogether. It, um, if you're going back into academia, you have to start designing courses, and so it formed the skeleton of the design for the new course that I did at Santa Barbara the next year. But also, I just remember Alan coming into that class and being absolutely fearless about demoing anything. He would fire up MATLAB and go off and look at the web and look for a description of something and think for a minute and try it in MATLAB and then explain off the top of his head to the class how it had worked. Um, I thought that was great. Sometimes it was something that had just occurred to him. Sometimes it was something he had stayed up all, all night the night before figuring out how to do, but it was, it was just amazing. Um, I 
in my lecturing, was never able to be as fearless or, or as smooth as Alan. And the other thing that, that, that I will say, that one class, that 1837 class did, was it was the first time I met Jeremy Kepner. Jeremy Kepner, who was at Lincoln Labs uh, already at that time, was sitting in on the class too. And uh, I, I lectured once on sparse matrices in the class, and I remember Jeremy asking me very hard questions from the back row. I, I did. I, Alan remembers this better than I do. I, right, that's right. I gave. I think I gave one 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 week of three lectures on sparse matrices in that class. Um, uh, as a, it also turns out that during that during that year, I, I met my wife in New England. So so changed my life in a lot of ways. Um, one of the things that I remember about Alan, uh, that I've always known about, about Alan, that I've always admired about Alan, is the way that he can think across disciplines. And so one of the specific memories that I remember from that, from that applied parallel computing class was, um, you know, I knew how fast multi-grid worked. I had explained it to people. I had read papers. I had, I had never implemented it. Um, it's this huge cloud of ideas that just come from all different directions, like a, you know, like a video game or something. Um, and Alan gave a, gave a lecture in 18337 in which he explained that there's actually a three-dimensional orthogonal basis for, for this algorithm, and it consists of one vector in the direction of computer science algorithms and discrete da data structures, one vector in the, in the direction of approximation theory, Taylor series, Maclaurin series, and one vector in the direction of programming, which is how you do arithmetic on multipole expansions, which you could call object-oriented programming, or you could call generic programming, or whatever. And once, one, as with so many things in linear algebra, once you have the basis right, it's easy to understand the algorithm. And of course, programming. Um, you know, the quote, a computational trick can also be a theoretical trick is, is from the, from Alan and from the, from the title of this, of this meeting. And, uh, you know, Alan's programming language design, of course, goes back at least as far as MATLAB star P in 1999, which formed the basis for star P and the interac interactive supercomputing startup and so forth, and, and eventually Julia, so. Um, so I said I was going to talk about graphs and matrices, and I am. This is my favorite coffee mug. Um, it's a graph, it's a matrix, of course, mathematically, a graph and a matrix are, in some sense, the same, the same object. And theoret in theory, in mathematics, graphs and matrices have been applied to each other, to the understanding of each other for as long as both have existed, or maybe a little bit longer. Um, but I want to talk specifically about computation on graphs and matrices, because when you want to compute with one of these objects, it's usually one or the other that you want to compute with, and surprisingly often, the other one is, is what you need in order to do that. Um, this, this mug, the other logo, the other um, slogan on this mug down there is from my colleague Phil Murky, shut up and compute something which is maybe a little ruder than Alan would ever be, but I think is entirely consistent with his philosophy. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with graphs for matrices because graphs have been used to compute with matrices for many, many decades. Um, in in, in prehistory, I could go back to Seymour Parter in, in the early 1960s, actually 1959, I think was when he first when he first described this. And he defined a one-person game on undirected graphs. It's, it has very simple rules, it goes like this. Uh, you pick a vertex and you mark it. You add edges to connect its unmarked neighbors, and you repeat. Those are all the rules, so I pick another vertex. That one has three unmarked neighbors. Two of them are already adjacent, so I have to add two more edges. Um, I pick that vertex, it has only one, un oh no, it has two unmarked neighbors, but they're already adjacent, so no new edges. This one has only one unmarked neighbor, and that one, of course, has no unmarked neighbors. So that was the game. 
kind of a boring game. Oh, what I forgot was to tell you what, how you score. Um, the scoring for the game is that your goal is to end up with as few edges as possible. So knowing that, let's try again. Uh, let's see, I can pick that vertex, and of course there is only one unmarked neighbor, so no new edges. That one has only one unmarked neighbor, so no new edges. That one has two, but they're already adjacent, and so forth. So in fact, for this particular graph, I can, I can play the game perfectly. I can end up with no more edges than I started with. This game, which Parter defined Don Rose, called the Vertex Elimination Game. Um, there it is just again. Uh, it's known that uh, on a general graph, the best play, play is NP complete. On, on that particular graph, you could end up with no extra edges, but if you think about a four cycle, think about a cycle of four vertices, whatever you mark first is gonna add an edge, so you can't play perfectly on, on every graph. And in fact, on arbitrary graphs, it's NP hard to figure out what the best play is. Uh, the final graph, the, what, what one thing Don Rose proved was that the final graph is always a chordal graph, which is an object that had been studied before this. A uh, chordal graph is a graph in which every cycle of at least four vertices has a shortcut edge, a chord. And it turns out that the final graph is always chordal and you can play perfectly if and only if the graph, the initial graph is chordal. Um, chordal graphs have a big theory. Uh, just for example, if I change the score from the fewest edges to the smallest complete subgraph in the graph, I get, I get the notion of the graph's so-called tree width, which is key to fixed parameter tractable algorithms, which are, which are um, in vogue, are, are something, of a, something of a subject today. Um, so what does this have to do with matrices? Well, this is a, this is a slide that, um, Alan accuses me of showing so often that everybody's already seen it, and I'm, you, probably most of you have seen it already. And maybe I did actually make it for your course, Alan, that may be. Um, I know the example comes from Joseph Liu, but who knows. Anyway, the, yes, well, I, I, I could, I know the paper of Joseph's from the 1980s that this example comes from, but it may be me that did it in PowerPoint. Well, it was me that did it in PowerPoint, and it may have been, it may have been in your class. Anyway, the point is that a symmetric graph, a, a, an undirected graph is a symmetric matrix, and a choice of an ordering of vertices is a symmetric permutation of the matrix, and then the graph, the chordal graph that you get by playing the game is the non-zero structure of the Cholesky factor of the matrix. This is, um, this is something that you actually know from yesterday because Dan used it again in his talk. After all these years, I'm sort of amazed that, oh, that would take me too far afield, but I'm still amazed by that, by that result, that, that, that just doing, playing this game and dropping things at random in a crafty way is so provably good. But anyway, so back in, back in, the, back in the 1970s, this was just how you did, how, how you did Cholesky factorization. And chordal graphs have a lot of theory and explain a lot about complexity and algorithms and design of algorithms for, for sparse factorization, which I'm not going to go into here. But um, it, it, for example, if I look at the vector, uh, this vector D that says, how many higher numbered neighbors does each vertex have? In other words, how many unmarked vertices were there when I, when I eliminated each vertex? Um, that's a vector of n numbers whose, that always ends with a zero. Um, the, the number of edges in the graph is the sum of those numbers, so is a, is a first number, and that's the number of non-zeros in the Cholesky factor, so that's how much memory you need to do a Cholesky factorization. The amount of work to do it in flops turns out to be the sum of the squares of those numbers, so it's a second moment, and the, um, amount of fast memory that you need to do this with the with what's called the multifrontal algorithm which i which i won't describe but you can think about you know trying to keep things local and you know just page them in when you need them um, the the amount of fast memory that you that you need scales as 
the square of the largest element. So it's so it's a it's an infinity it's an infinity moment, and that that infinity moment is also is also the tree width. 1960 wasn't actually when this started. Um, um, Harry Markowitz, uh, economist, um, is credited with term with with. Uh, um, thinking up the, with, with, with being the first one to call a sparse matrix a sparse matrix. Um, this, uh, this was in the 1950s when he was um, at Rand Corporation inventing portfolio theory and um, laying the groundwork for, as far as I know, the only Nobel Prize that's been given yet for, for sparse matrix work. Um, which was the 1990 Nobel Prize? We heard this morning about a, a Nobel Prize uh, in, that 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 has to do with numerical linear algebra and contend uh, C matrices, but uh, but this is the only sparse matrix Nobel Prize that I know about. Um, but this is this is you know this is what I think of as the canonical example of combinatorics in the service in the service of linear algebra. And since then, you know, by the early by the early 2010s, many, many, many graph algorithms had been used and invented and implemented at large scale for sparse matrix computation. And in fact, as of then, as of you know 2005, as of the early 2000s, the largest computations on graphs that had ever been done in the world were in the service of scientific computing in general and sparse matrix computation in particular. If you, were, if you were a graph theorist, you might or might not be interested in, linear, in numerical linear algebra, but if you were a graph supercomputing guy, you were working on numerical linear algebra, almost, almost surely. Um, since then, however, as Jeremy talked about this morning, uh, the pendulum has has sort of swung back because since since the early 2000s, since 2010 or so, um, graphs have increasingly become objects, interesting objects, worthwhile, important objects of computation in their own right. Graphs coming from anything from financial transactions to protein interactions to social networks to, you know. 10, 10 other applications easily. And so we have found that, well, the graph people found, started finding, that all of this technology, who knows about, who knows about implementing big graphs in parallel as of 2010? Well, it's the sparse matrix people. So the pendulum sort of started swinging back. And in fact, computational numerical linear algebra, all of the techniques that were developed there are starting to repay a debt of about 60 years or so to, um, to, uh, uh, to graph algorithms. So again, Jeremy this morning uh, showed, showed a picture of our book, which is, which is one of the things that kicked us off. Jeremy ran a, a study at Lincoln in 2060 um, try to 2006 that is um, trying to trying to build build uh, build graph algorithms in the language of linear algebra and we published it in an edited an edited collection which we dedicated to Dennis Healy which is another good story that I don't have time to tell um, which eventually culminated in 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 uh, the graph laws, which I think the CAPI was 2017. Is that right, Tim, Jeremy? I'm not. Yeah, 17. Uh, in anyway, um, so the graph laws are are um, doing. Jeremy explained it. I don't need to explain it. Um, um, using linear algebra to do graph computations, but typically linear algebra over other semi rings besides the real field or the complex field. Um, you know, max plus, min plus gives you shortest paths. Um, Boolean algebra gives you connectivity. More exotic things give you more complicated algorithms. But in general, the idea is that the the, the ring of values, the semi ring of values, is attributes that live on vertices and, and edges. The 
addition operation is in some sense aggregating data at vertices and the multiplication operation is in some sense um, processing data that's, that's crossing edges and what exactly that means depends on what algorithm you're doing. Um, so in, in 2017 or so, the graph laws C API was promulgated. It's a wonderful, precise API. It's a complicated API, and it looks a little messy in C because doing, doing, I won't call it generic programming, but trying to do generic programming kinds of things in C is inherently messy. But the best thing about it is that there is a magnificent implementation, which is which is due to Tim, due to Tim Davis, uh, which. I don't have nearly time to describe in detail, but it's wonderful. If you haven't, if you haven't seen the sweet sparse graph laws, you should, you should read about it. You should look at Tim's talks online. Jeremy talked about hypersparse matrices. You can have matrices of dimension two to the 60 by two to the 60 in, the, in, in, in sweet sparse graph laws. It, it lives underneath Redis graph and, and all sorts of things. Okay. Um, Graphs, matrices, and programming. So I want to spend the last few minutes talking about the programming part. In particular, if you're going to do all this stuff, all this high performance programming on graphs and matrices and so forth, what, what do you need in the way of a language? What language are you going to use? And well, what language do you want to use? Well, for what? You have to you have to say. And what I mean for what is is three things which are all a little bit different from each other. One is developing algorithms on irregular structures. I'll call them graph and matrix algorithms. One is experimenting with them because you don't know unless you try. Um, at sort of medium scale, but also maybe at fairly large scale because things change as you scale them. And every now and then, you find out that there's one that you actually want to use in anger at the very largest scale. You want to use the largest machines in the world to do something. And so you, you want to implement some of, these, some of these at really big scale. So what do you want to use? Well, when I got started in this business, we used Fortran 77. I wrote graph algorithms in 1477, it was better than nothing. Um, a few years later, C became popular. It was better than Fortran 77. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, the breakthrough, though, I think, for the exploratory computing side of this business was, was MATLAB, the, the first breakthrough in the 1980s. Interactive, fast turnaround, very expressive within its domain, and was very useful for exploring matrices at, at sort of smallish scale. Um, and then a few years later, when, when MATLAB um, got sparse matrices sort of invisibly under the hood, it became useful at sort of medium scale for exploring graphs if you were willing to write your graph algorithms in the language of linear algebra. And this actually was what first convinced me that this was a useful way to think about graph algorithms, graph algorithms because it was the only way you could do them in MATLAB in the 1990s. Um, that chain of development, I think, logically leads to Julia, which does write a lot of the things that you know, people have been struggling to do all, all along. And so people use Julia for exploring, well, graphs and matrices and lots of other things at, at small scale to large scale. But I haven't talked about the third bullet yet, the implementing at very large scale. Um, because there, I'm talking about you know, irregular algorithms, lots of communication, blah, blah, blah. Parallelism for high performance and scale brings in issues of scheduling and in particular of locality, of, of reducing communication. And so um, you know, there, I, this isn't a history of parallel programming languages. That's a, different, that's a different lecture. But the MATLAB star P, star P development, for example, handled those issues by raising the level of the primitives to a level where you could hide them underneath. And that works great as long as you can live in the world of those primitives. Um, for me, 
in the in the early 2000s and even early 2010s, my my favorite approach, my most productive approach for for me and my colleagues, was what's called PGAS languages, partition global address space languages like like Universal Par Parallel C (UPC), and. To, to finish off in the last couple of minutes here, I'm going to borrow a couple of slides from a different talk um, with, my, with my colleague Jason Davini from IDA uh, on a thing called bail, which is motivated by partition global address space not being good enough anymore. So in PGAS, you get the illusion of shared memory but you know what's local and what's not. And so to get high performance, you try to keep as much as you can local. And if you occasionally have to go off and look at a priority queue on somebody else's processor, as long as you don't do it too much, you don't worry about it. You don't sweat it. You use fine-grained communication. And that works great if you take a little bit of care and if your machine is not too bad at fine-grained global communication. My two favorite parallel supercomputers were the Cray T3E and the Cray X1 in the, in the, uh, in the, 19, in the um, early 2000s. Um, but the trouble is that this fine-grained communication doesn't work anymore with the kinds of parallel computers that we've got now. Now, We've lost our T3Es and our X1s, and so you can't just go off and talk to somebody else. You have to be willing to bundle, bundle up messages and send them back and forth, and before you know it, you're back and you're back in programming an MPI again. Um, we didn't want to do that, so we wrote a library, which, uh, which we called XStack, but I'll get, I'll get to that. We wrote a library. And, and here's what happened. So this is, this is a UPC. This two, these two lines here are UPC for a very simple computation. It's a sort of an indexed gather. Big table is a distributed array. And I am sitting here with my own local index and destination. And I am picking things out and putting them into my basket. Um, random lookouts for a distributed table. Here's what it looks like in, in our aggregation library, XStack, in, in, uh, in essentially UPC. Uh, wait. <laughs> I'm not going to go into it. But you know, you're putting things on queues, and you have, you have a library underneath you that's keeping you from, anyway, it, it's not beautiful. Um, what have we done? Well. It, for the applications we were looking at for these big graphs, the XStack code is wicked fast. That's not a technical statement, but, but it's, it's very efficient in terms of, in particular, bandwidth measures. It, it, it essentially uses all it can of the machine's bisection bandwidth and injection bandwidth, but it looks awful. It's worse than Fortran 77. So not knowing the answer to that, and this is where I'm going to stop, we released a thing called bail, which is a plea for help. What bail is, is well, it has our aggregation library XStack and also conveyors, which is the sort of current, more slightly more user-friendly version of it. And it has these nine mini applications, including this in indexed gather, and it's intended as a vehicle for discussion of how you should do productive, large-scale, distributed parallel programming on, on irregular objects. Um, and what we are doing with it is trying to get other people to write in their own languages something with aggregation in it that can do the apps in bail. So here's one that Bill Carlson did with Rust, with a Rust implementation of conveyors. Here are two different versions in C++ in different styles. Here's one that's a C library from uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprises. Here's one in Chapel, which actually hides so much that you can't even see what it's doing. But the idea is that we want to make parallel programming easier and more productive. 
we think that this notion of aggregation under the covers is going to be a necessary part of thinking about the largest parallel programs in the future. And we certainly don't want to be writing conveyor codes in 10 years. So please help. As far as I know, nobody's ever written an aggregation library for distributed memory in Julia. Somebody should. I'll stop. Happy birthday, Alan. Thank you for having us here.